Thank you very much. Uh, I'm well aware we're going from one extreme uh, with high art uh, to the other, which is food. But food is, I think, going to be one of the key issues in politics, in economics, and in financial markets over not just the next few years, over the next 20 years. So the title of my presentation, Food Policy and the Environmental Credit Crunch, what is that about? Well, the most important thing it's about is that it's the title of a book I published earlier this year, still available from Amazon and all good booksellers. But the environmental credit crunch is, in fact, more important than what happened in financial markets in 2008-2009. Credit, in economic terms, is simply using tomorrow's standard of living to raise today's standard of living. It's a, it's a transfer of living standards over time. So if I want to buy a flat screen television, you know, being an economist, I can't possibly afford to do that. Being in the United Kingdom, however, I have access to credit. And so what I do is I buy the flat screen television today and I accept that I will be paying for that in the future, so I raise my standard of living today assuming watching television raises your standard of living, and I lower my standard of living in the future. And that is financial credit. But we also have environmental credit, that I can burn a barrel of oil to heat my house today, but in doing so, I accept that I cannot burn that barrel of oil in the future. So I am raising my standard of living today by consuming an environmental resource, and I am lowering my standard of living in the future. The issue today is that the world economy is currently consuming 1.5 times the output of the, the sustainable output of the planet in order to enjoy today's standard of living. It's a bit like spending 50% of your household income on credit card every year, borrowing 50% of your income on credit card every year in order to sustain your standard of living. For the benefit of any Americans in the audience, borrowing 50% of your income on credit card is not sustainable. You'll just have to take my word on that. What this means is, we are consuming environmental resources at a rate that is completely unsustainable today, and we've got another two billion people coming into the world over the next 20 years. And nowhere is this going to be more visible than in food, where calorie consumption is going to become a significant political, economic, and financial challenge. We cannot continue consuming environmental resources at today's rate, and yet we need more environmental resources to feed a population that is growing by two billion. That is the environmental credit crunch. Now, superficially, this sounds like an excellent incentive to rush out and buy some agricultural land immediately because demand for food is only going to go up, and we're already over-consuming environmental resources. But there are two really big problems with uh, consuming uh, food and its relationship to investing. The first of these is politics. Food is an intensely political topic. And politics is going to interfere in food distribution repeatedly over uh, the next 20 years. In developed economies, consumers can spend 40%, 50% of, uh, sorry, in developing economies, 40% to 50% of consumer spending goes 
on food. If you create an environment where food prices are rising, that is going to create social unrest, that is going to spill over into political problems, and politicians will take action. The Chinese government over the last 10 years has been very concerned about food, food production. Part of their philosophy has to be uh, to go out and invest in farms in countries like Thailand and Indonesia to ensure that China has a reliable food supply in the future. This has got to be one of the most idiotic policies any government has ever pursued anywhere in the world. The moment the price of rice rises in Thailand, do you really think the Thai government is going to say, by all means, carry on exporting the rice out of Thailand to China? Of course they won't. They'll do what they did a few years ago. They will impose an export ban. They will force local farmers to sell to the local market at a fixed price to keep the price down for local consumers. It is inevitable. So looking to emerging markets, looking to agricultural land in those places as a potential source of investment is, in my view, completely nonsensical. But this also applies in developed economies. In developed economies, the political risk around food is also very high. And this arises out of one of the, the great tragedies of modern civilization. The great tragedy of modern civilization is that there are not enough economists in the world. We have instead a surplus of irrational consumers. When I think about inflation, I will think about a basket measuring about five or 6,000 different items, taking a sample of probably about 80,000 different prices, appropriately weighted, hedonically adjusted, put into a Lespray's index, and I have my inflation number. For some reason, consumers won't do that. When a consumer thinks about inflation, all they think about is food and energy, because that is what they buy frequently. Back in March of this year, I knew with absolute certainty that my colleagues on our equity trading floor in UBS London were going to attack me for our inflation forecast. I was going to be told our UK inflation forecast was absurd. It was far too high. The reason I was going to be attacked was because the price of a Snickers bar in the UBS vending machine had just gone from 50 pence to 60 pence. Clearly, we're facing 20% inflation because the price of a chocolate bar has gone up by 20%. It doesn't matter that I say to my colleagues, look, there's only so much chocolate even an equity salesperson can consume in 24 hours. The fact is, every 24 hours, they are reminded that price has just gone up by 20%. That is the price that they remember. They forget the fact that their television was cheaper last year or that service sector costs haven't risen. They remember the food prices. And this means that political sensitivity to food is very, very acute. And that makes investing dangerous. The second issue around food and the environment as a, as a location for investment is the complexity of food is also a very, very big problem. In a country like Israel, food is not food. The food that we've got set out on the side here is not food at all. The farmer will get about 20% of the cost of the food in this room today. The other 80% is going on the processing cost, the distribution cost, the serving staff cost. The other 80% is labor as part of a long and very complex supply chain. So simply to say that food is going to be a, a, a rising commodity in the future is not actually true because investing in food is more than about investing in farming. It's investing in a very, very long and a very, very complex supply chain. And that presents a real challenge for investing. So how do we deal with this? It seems like humanity is facing a problem that we have uh, a rising population, a finite capacity to grow food. We can't create more land anytime soon. We have political sensitivity 
and we have increased complexity in terms of food distribution. Well, the way that you deal with this, the solution to this over the next 20 years, in economic terms and in environmental terms, is exactly the same. You need to reduce waste. You need to become more efficient. If we look at the United States today, the United States throws away 50% of all of its food uneaten. The vegetable waste in the United States in a single week would feed the entire continent of Africa for three days. The amount of waste in America is huge. If we could reduce that waste, even halve that waste, much of the global food problem would be solved. But it's not just America that wastes food. In India today, 50% of all food is thrown away uneaten. In India. Now, the difference, of course, is that in the United States, it's the consumer you know, throwing away a half-eaten pizza. In India, the food never gets to the consumer because the distribution mechanism is so inefficient, it rots before it actually gets to the consumer sector. So the complexity of different supply chains creates different areas of waste, but also with that, different investment opportunities. And this, I think, is the key focus for the next few years. Globally, as, as a, a world economy, we waste about 40% of global food. In emerging markets, this is due to chronic inefficiency in the supply chain. In developed economies, it's due to consumer behavior. If we can find investment opportunities that reduce that waste, that is going to be something which governments are going to welcome, not try and protect against. It is something which is going to be very closely sought, and it will create uh, many advantages for the global economy. But the complexity of the supply chains does make this difficult. One of the great problems in looking for efficiencies is that you may just shift inefficiencies to elsewhere in supply chain, which from an environmental perspective and in the long term from an efficiency perspective is not particularly desirable. So in the United Kingdom, one of the great changes wrought by the financial credit crunch is that people have started buying food on a daily basis again. This has been disastrous for the UK supermarkets. Their, their model of out-of-town superstores has completely failed because people were very, very conscious that they were throwing away food. If you shop once a week, you, know, you may plan to have fish and a salad and a bottle of wine on Thursday night, but by the time you get to Thursday, you're exhausted, the Federal Reserve's done something stupid again, you're too tired to cook, so you struggle back home, you dial for a pizza, you throw away the salad, you throw away the fish, you probably don't throw away the bottle of wine, and you waste the food. But if you're buying food on a daily basis, as is now happening, 25% of UK food is now bought on a daily basis, up from less than 15% before the financial crisis. Then you make the decision about what to buy on a daily basis, you waste less food. So that's great. We're reducing food waste. That sounds like we've got a solution. We should be investing in micro stores. Except the problem is, if you're buying daily portions of food, there is more transport involved in that, there is more food waste in the store, the food is more processed, which involves more waste, um, and there is a lot more packaging involved as well. So you end up simply transferring the costs elsewhere along the chain. What we need are revolutionary technologies, things which will really transform our overall production. And there are technologies that come through which do change efficiency dramatically, though often in very unusual ways. One of the greatest revolutions in agriculture in the last hundred years is the introduction of satellite navigation. Because now, if you are a farmer in the United Kingdom, your tractor will know to within 30 centimeters where you are. 
It will know what the soil quality is in that part of the field, what the shade is in that part of the field, what the average rainfall is in that part of the field, and it will know precisely how much fertilizer to apply to the soil in that part of the field. You move on 30 centimeters and everything changes. The result is the United Kingdom is now 98% efficient in fertilizer application. 98% of the fertilizer goes into the plant. Why does that matter? That's the most energy intensive part of agriculture. In mainland China today, agriculture is around 22% fertilizer efficient. China is using almost five times as much fertilizer as it needs to, destroying its environment, destroying its water supply, and creating far higher food costs than it needs to over time. Introduce GPS into China, you revolutionize the agricultural situation. Where is the catch? In the United Kingdom, the tractor that you're sitting in costs around about one million pounds sterling. In China, you've got a guy with a basket throwing fertilizer out by hand. Introducing GPS into that model is going to be difficult. But this is where innovation has to come in. The global economy has to tackle head on the environmental credit crunch. In the next 20 years, we are going to have major, major issues in terms of global growth, in terms of social stability, if we cannot solve the problem of feeding ourselves efficiently at a low price over the medium term. The investment strategy around this, I think, should not focus on the obvious knee-jerk, let's buy some agricultural land. Politics and complexity will work against you. What we need to focus on is efficiency if we are going to be able to solve what is an extraordinarily complex problem for humanity over the next 20 years. And the best way to start understanding the complexity is to go to Amazon and buy copies of my book. Thank you very much. <laughs>